Refugees today come from a wide variety of geographic, sociocultural, and linguistic backgrounds. Many have suffered catastrophic events, such as torture, and most have suffered multiple losses, including the death of loved ones. Now they must adjust to an alien land in which they may never have wanted to live. While most refugees cope well, they are at greater risk for developing mental disorders. Western health professionals often feel poorly trained to assess mental disorders in those whose experiences are so different from their own. The practitioner with little cross-cultural training or experience will often over or under assess pathology, either attributing all symptoms to cultural differences or ignoring cultural factors altogether. Even practitioners with cross-cultural experience find that treating the mentally ill refugee is not only challenging diagnostically, but is complicated by the lack of community resources and expertise. In addition, most practitioners work within a mental health system which was not designed to meet the special needs of the refugee. In refugees, we see the same spectrum of mental disorder as in other cultures, but some disorders such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, paranoia, and even brief reactive psychosis occur with greater frequency. However, the symptoms of the disorders may be different. For example, many refugees with depression have primarily physical complaints. In addition to these different symptom manifestations, there are culture-bound syndromes. But many experts believe that these are culturally specific ways of expressing symptoms of psychiatric disorders which we find in our Western diagnostic system. The balance between the culturally specific and the universal taxes the flexibility of every healthcare professional who treats refugees. It is obviously best to intervene early to prevent the development of disorders. Unfortunately, this rarely occurs. Many refugees with mental illness are unfamiliar with the American mental health services and consequently do not seek help. Others present chiefly with physical problems and are inappropriately referred for biomedical services. Much expense and suffering could be avoided if accurate assessment and diagnosis were completed when the refugee is first seen for help. The psychiatric interview is often the main source of information about refugees' mental health, but if conducted poorly, it can lead to inappropriate treatment. The initial interview is only the first step of an evaluation process that may take several interview sessions. However, it is critically important to establish trust to make a preliminary assessment and to formulate a treatment plan. In this videotape, we will show a simulated interview and discuss many of the mistakes made, discuss the expectations both refugees and clinicians may bring to the interview, describe interview content, approaches, and problems, and discuss special issues in interviewing refugees. These special issues include evaluating the needs of torture victims, addressing counter-transference, using rating scales, interviewing children, adolescents, and families, and working with interpreters. In preparing for this program, we have consulted a number of experts in refugee mental health. During this program, some of these experts will share with us their comments and perspectives. The following is a simulated interview representing a Western-trained psychiatrist interviewing a Vietnamese patient with the help of a bilingual Vietnamese interpreter. This vignette illustrates mistakes often made by inexperienced clinicians. It was developed by Dr. Steve Schoen, a psychiatrist who directs the Refugee Mental Health Program in California. Joining Dr. Schoen are two Vietnamese social workers, Ms. Laura Lam of the University of Minnesota Hospital and Clinics, playing the part of the interpreter, and Mr. Hon Nguyen of Weiler Foundation Refugee Program in St. Paul, Minnesota, playing the part of the patient. <coughs> Uh, good morning, I'm Dr. Uh, Lee, and uh, let's see, which one of you is the patient I'm supposed to see this morning, and which one of you is my interpreter? Uh, this is Mr. Nguyen, the patient, and I am Lan, I'm the interpreter today. Okay, glad to meet you, Lan. Uh, why don't the two of you put your ta chairs a little closer together, since you two will be talking to each other mostly. And I'll just uh, sit over here and start asking you a few questions. Okay, it says here that Mr. Well, the, the patient uh, is referred for medical clinic because he was complaining of headaches and dizziness, and they worked him up but couldn't find anything medically wrong with him, so they wanted us to evaluate him. Could you ask him how long he's been having the uh, the headaches and the dizziness? Uh, 
Bác sĩ hỏi anh là anh bị nhức đầu với nhìn chóng mặt bao lâu rồi? À, mấy năm nay rồi coi nó đau hoài, sáng đau, trưa đau, tối đau, không có làm ăn gì được chân. He said for years now it hurts in the morning, hurts at night, hurts all the time. Oh, okay, okay. But, do but how long has he been having it? Like one year, two years, three years, six months? You know how long? Bác sĩ hỏi là anh bị nhức đầu á, một năm, hai năm, ba năm. Um, Sáu tháng hay là một tháng? Không nhớ coi, nhức lâu lắm rồi, mấy năm rồi đau hoài á. He said for years and he hurts all the time. He doesn't okay, know exactly you know, like how, how long. long. Uh, he doesn't know exactly. Well, one year, two years? Maybe two years. Two years, okay. Two years. Okay, is he taking any medicine for uh, his headaches? Bác sĩ hỏi anh là có uống thuốc gì để trị cho bệnh nhức đầu như là chóng mặt không? Thì đau phải kiếm thuốc uống chứ cô, tôi đem đeo cái thuốc này cô coi thế nè. He's he's taking he's taking this medicine for the headache. Is, is this a pretty strong or powerful uh, medicine? It's very good medicine. Okay, so it's pretty strong stuff. Huh? Yes. Okay, could you ask him how many of these uh, pills he's taking every day? Bác sĩ hỏi anh là anh mỗi ngày anh uống mấy viên? Một ngày uống năm lọ gì đó. He's taking five bottles like that a day. Five bottles of these? Yes. So. Uh, Five bottles. Yes. Okay. Sounds like he's uh, he may be overdosing on these uh, these pills. Can you ask him how long he's been suicidal? He said that he's had a headache and he's just come to see you for a headache and he doesn't understand about being suicidal or. Dying, I doesn't like he that. know how long he's been feeling that way? No. He doesn't know? No. Okay. Could you ask him if he's been hearing voices? Bác sĩ hỏi anh, anh có nghe giọng nói không? Dạ có nha. Nghe tiếng nói nha. Yes, he does hear voices. He's hearing voices? Yes. Okay, so he's having auditory hallucinations. Okay, now I want to find out about his uh, ability to abstract. Abstract? Yeah, you know, abstract. Uh, I want you to ask him a, a proverb and have him tell tell you what it means. Ask him what this means. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Bác sĩ nói là có hỏi anh câu này anh có hiểu hay không? Um, cục đá nó ngang thì nó không có bám vào rong với reo. Anh có hiểu là gì không? Cái gì mà đá với reo ở đây cô? Tôi nói tôi bệnh vô kiếm thuốc uống này nói. Cô nói gì đá vào ra tôi không có bị hiểu cái gì á. He said he has a headache and he sees you for the headache. He doesn't understand about the stone and the moss. He, he doesn't, doesn't he doesn't know what it means. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Right, he doesn't know. He doesn't, he doesn't understand know. that. Hmm. Okay. Poor comprehension. <coughs> Possible borderline. Intelligence. Okay, I'll tell you what. I got a meeting right now, and I'm going to have to uh, go to my meeting. So we're going to have to finish this evaluation next week. So he's going to have to come back next week, okay? Okay. 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 Come back next Tuesday at 2 o'clock, okay? Tell me. And uh, we'll finish up. Uh, Thứ ba sao hai giờ Thank you very much, Linda. Trời ơi, cô có biết không? Nguyên một ngày hôm nay là tôi lại đây, tôi đợi từ sáng đến giờ. Đi cũng khó, mà lại cũng khó. Giờ vô bác sĩ không có khám một coi đứng dậy đi ra. There were a number of errors in this interview. Clearly, the clinician spent no preparation time with the interpreter, whose name he even failed to learn. As elaborated later in this program, it's very important to have a pre-session meeting with the interpreter so that the goals and purpose of the interview can be discussed. The meeting can also be useful to the clinician in gathering culturally appropriate information to aid in the evaluation. The physical setting of the room was not conducive to the evaluation. Instead of a seating arrangement that would recognize the role of the interpreter as the facilitator of communication, the arrangement separated the clinician from both the interpreter and the patient. The back of the chair became a barrier in this scene. The clinician speaks to the interpreter, not to the patient. 
The clinician should always greet the patient, as in any other clinical setting, and address questions to the patient directly, not to the interpreter. The clinician also prematurely interrupts the interpreter and projects a sense of time urgency throughout. One must realize that an evaluation using an interpreter inevitably takes longer than without one. There are two possibilities to consider, setting aside more time for the initial interview or expecting to get less accomplished during the interview. At the end of the interview, the clinician abruptly walks out. This leaves the patient upset and confused and eliminates any post-session discussion with the interpreter. More specific errors include misinterpreting the use of traditional medicine as a suicide gesture, choosing a proverb which is meaningless in the patient's culture. He says he has a headache and he sees you for the headache and he doesn't understand about the stone and the he moss. He doesn't, doesn't, un he doesn't know what it means. A rolling stone gathers no moss. Right, he doesn't know. He doesn't, he doesn't understand know. that. And attributing the patient's hearing actual voices to having hallucinations. Yes, he does hear voices. He is hearing voices? Yes. Okay. So he's having auditory hallucinations. All of these mistakes are serious. It is also important to note that the clinician in this vignette failed to discuss confidentiality with the patient. Refugee patients are typically not familiar with the concept of confidentiality, and this needs to be explained in some detail to them. The stigma of mental illness is especially great in many refugee groups. They need to be reassured that what they will tell the doctor will not go back to the refugee community. Otherwise, refugees may be reluctant to share information. You may also have noticed that the clinician in the vignette did not attempt to establish rapport with the patient. Rapport can be established by conveying authority and expertise, showing willingness to help, and taking time. Some of the behavior shown in the vignette would be offensive in any setting. Beyond that, this clinician failed to consider the patient's cultural differences and did not modify his interviewing technique. Consequently, he did not get an adequate history or adequate information. Unfortunately, these mistakes are too often made by clinicians when interviewing refugee patients. Throughout this program, we will offer suggestions on modifying the interview technique when evaluating refugee patients. As you saw in the vignette, the patient came with clear expectations and beliefs about the care he should receive. In this section, we will consider some of the individual and cultural characteristics which influence the refugee's expectations and beliefs. How these are understood and responded to affects the refugee's development of trust in the clinician and compliance with treatment. The clinician cannot be aware of all these characteristics for any one individual or group of refugees, but must be sensitive to differences. Among the factors affecting actions and expectations during an interview are the refugee's age, sex, religion, degree of urbanization, education, and former or current occupational status. Refugees from many cultures are oriented more towards family and community than in the United States, where the importance of the individual is unusually great. Many refugees feel that personal issues should be kept within the family and are not appropriately shared with outsiders including mental health professionals. In addition, the family often has a significant role in determining whether and to what extent the doctor's recommendations are followed. The hierarchical structure of the family and the respect for authority, elders, religious leaders, and healers, often makes refugees seemingly cooperative patients. However, sometimes politeness masquerades true cooperation. In general, many refugees are familiar with healing practices that share features with what we refer to as the medical model. That is, in the medical model, the physician usually takes an active role in reducing the patient's symptoms by providing treatment, either medications or medical procedures. Similarly, the healers and shaman of many refugee groups often take an authoritative and active role in the treatment of their patients. They typically provide cure in the form of herbal medicine, healing rituals, or physical procedures such as acupuncture. Thus, the authoritative and active role of the psychiatrist in diagnosis and treatment, often with medication, fits with refugee expectations. In our vignette, the patient came to see the doctor because of his headaches. However, he did not receive treatment to relieve his headaches. Rather, he was treated curtly and was told to come back. No wonder he was upset and confused at the end of the interview. 
When providing psychiatric care to refugees, it is also very useful for clinicians to have some familiarity with different disease etiology concepts, a topic that has been explored extensively by anthropologists. In every culture, the healthcare system tends to reflect beliefs about disease causality that are firmly rooted in the social context. For some refugee groups, disease may be caused by a particular agent, such as a god, ghost, or witch. Others may conceive disease as a balance that has been disturbed, or they may believe that a strong emotional experience, such as fright, can cause illness. Several typologies have been proposed to classify these different perspectives on disease etiology. Anthropologists George Foster and Barbara Anderson proposed the typology of personalistic and naturalistic. This avoids pejorative contrasts such as primitive versus scientific or even traditional versus modern, which are too often referred to by Westerners in trying to understand different cultures. Whatever the refugees' belief system, it appears that most refugees can adapt to the health system of the new culture and integrate the healing methods from their homeland with trips to the clinic and hospital. Now let us discuss the structure and content of the interview. A variety of approaches can be used to structure the initial interview. The most common is an open-ended or unstructured interview. It is also possible to use a semi-structured interview. The second approach allows a clinician to gather information about symptoms in a systematic way while providing flexibility to record the patient's story in a narrative. As with any patient, the psychiatric interview consists of the history and the mental status examination. Within the history, the clinician needs to obtain information on the presenting illness, psychiatric medical and family history, and psychosocial background. The clinician needs to document the refugee's reasons for seeking help and the referral source. It is important to discuss confidentiality with the refugee patient at this initial stage. Then the clinician can start asking details of the present illness. The inquiry should emphasize symptoms, especially those that lead to the most common diagnoses. For example, sleep disturbance is a good indicator of level of distress and a good barometer of change on follow-up visits. Therefore, it is particularly important to document details of insomnia, hypersomnia, frequent awakening, nightmares, and total sleep time. Refugees may not acknowledge feelings of depression and anxiety, despite the presence of a major depressive syndrome or generalized anxiety disorder. For example, in several of the Southeast Asian languages, there are no comparable words for anxiety and depression, although there are words to describe psychotic or crazy behavior. The clinician should not be alarmed if the refugee patient fails to express feelings of subjective distress. By contrast, Concerns about employment and frustrations with the American culture are commonly shared. Remember, it often takes a long time for the refugee to trust a Western practitioner and willingly share personal information. Consequently, focusing on the symptoms of emotional distress may be the only way to get enough information during the interview to develop an initial treatment plan. Another difficulty is in obtaining past history. For many refugees, psychiatric treatment as we know it in the West did not exist or it existed only in large institutions operated by Westerners. As a result, patients may have minimal or no treatment history and may not be able to remember or acknowledge their untreated symptoms. Many refugee patients fail to understand the relevance of questions which are not directly related to their presenting complaint. For example, in the vignette you watched, our patient got extremely upset when the doctor asked him about suicidal intent and hallucinations. However, it's important to explain to the patient the significance of seemingly irrelevant questions. Other areas are also sensitive. Problems with opium, alcohol, or other substances are seldom reported in an initial interview because of fears of deportation. For Southeast Asian refugees, opium dependency is the primary reason for denying acceptance in a final resettlement country. However, it is important to inquire fully on the use of drugs, including over-the-counter and prescription medications, herbal medicines, opium, or alcohol. It is often useful to ask the patient to bring in all of their medication bottles to the next visit. Asking about family history can be difficult. In particular, problems arise when asking about illness in the family, specifically mental illness or retardation. 
These are also grounds for exclusion from resettlement. Common physical causes for mental illness in refugees include head trauma, malaria, parasitic infections, syphilis, and nutritional deficiencies. Therefore, one should always gather information thoroughly about these problems. The refugee's psychosocial background is a particularly important part of history taking. The clinician must never assume that the only important aspect of the refugee's life started after resettlement. In fact, it's the catastrophic experiences before resettlement that put many refugees at risk for mental illness. At the same time, the migration history of different refugee groups can vary dramatically. It is also important to know how the patient adjusted and lived prior to becoming a refugee. In addition, one needs to determine the patient's degree of adjustment in the United States. As discussed in the primary prevention program of this series, the refugee experience can be divided into four major stages, which include the period of chaos preceding flight, the flight itself, the stay in the country of first asylum, which likely includes internment in refugee camps, and the final stage of resettlement in the United States. It is often useful to keep in mind these stages when asking about psychosocial history. Now that we have discussed the history, let us focus on completing the mental status examination. Its purpose is to provide an accurate description of the patient's functioning. Areas of functioning that are assessed for refugee clients do not differ from those of the mainstream clients. However, there are certain cultural differences which need to be taken into account. Otherwise, even the most well-oriented and alert refugee patient can appear to be confused and disoriented, suicidal, or even psychotic. Except for the cognitive assessment, much of the information needed for completing the mental status exam has already been gathered throughout the history-taking part of the interview. Major areas assessed in the mental status examination include the physical aspect and the behavior, abnormal thought processes, cognitive functioning, and risk of harm to self or others. First, one must describe the physical aspect of the patient and his or her behavior throughout the interview. However, when interpreting the patient's behavior, the clinician must be alert to cultural differences. For example, many refugee patients may not have good eye contact. This may not necessarily reflect poor social skills or guilt. Instead, it may simply express respect or deference towards the interviewer. When determining the patient's affect from his or her behavior, similar difficulties arise. Dr. Jean Carlin, a psychiatrist who has had extensive experience with refugee children, offers us this perspective. Um, the di most difficult problems in interviewing people from other cultures, and certainly children, I think is assessing the emotional content, which is so important. And that's probably the most difficult because facial expressions vary from country to country, body language varies from culture to culture. And um, uh, what people will express to a stranger may not be the way they would express emotions in their own home. I think these are things we have to be sensitive to. Another thing is many adolescents, especially female adolescents, um, and particularly from Southeast Asia, will giggle when they're really embarrassed, or they will laugh when they to prevent themselves crying. Even adults will do that. As a psychiatrist, I would say this person's re emotional response is inappropriate to the content. There's something wrong. But the laughing is frequently an embarrassment or a prevention of crying. I think it's important to understand that. Symptoms of abnormal thought processes, such as paranoid ideation, delusions, and hallucinations, must be evaluated. It is critical to distinguish between normative cultural practices, behaviors, and beliefs, and pathological processes. If an interpreter is used, as is often the case in working with refugees, literal interpretation may be the only way to determine if thought processes are abnormal. Careful questioning, along with detailed clarification, is also necessary. As we saw in the vignette, one simple question such as, have you been hearing voices, with no additional clarification, will not confirm the presence or absence of hallucinations. Assessing delusions is also complicated because it is influenced by the patient's worldview. What may appear to be delusional in one culture can be quite normal in another. Dr. Michelle Klopner, a psychologist who works extensively with Haitian refugees, cautions us regarding the assessment of abnormal thought processes. 
Well, I think that one thing that comes to mind there immediately is that when one is considering the mental status examination, that one has to realize that for most purposes, it is based within Western Anglo concepts of psychiatry and also dysfunction. And I have to say that there are certain cautions and safeguards that one needs to have in place when considering doing cross-cultural mental status examinations. In particular with Haitians, I think it's very important to specify a plane of reference in doing that type of evaluation. So if someone were to say that um, uh, he or she would hear voices in the middle of the night, um, it actually might mean that there was a very friendly uh, spirit of a dead relative and that might be uh, a good token, so to speak, within the culture, as opposed to being a very frightening and pathological type of event in that patient's life system. Now we move on to cognitive assessment. This includes abstract reasoning, orientation, fund of information, calculations, and memory. In assessing abstract reasoning, you cannot expect refugee patients to know the meaning of American proverbs, such as, a rolling stone gathers no moss. If proverbs are to be used, selecting proverbs from the patient's own culture is more appropriate. During the pre-session with the interpreter, the clinician can ask for proverbs from the patient's culture to use in the evaluation. Orientation, especially to time, has to be assessed in a culturally appropriate way. Many refugees do not keep track of the day, date, or sometimes even the year in the same way that we do. Many patients know which country they are in, but they may not know the name of their state, county, or city, particularly if they have recently arrived. Knowing the name of the President of the United States may also relate more to the length of their stay in the new country than to knowledge of current information. Instead, the interviewer may want to inquire in a more relevant way, such as asking about important people in the country of origin. The patient's level of education will determine the mode of assessing mental alertness and ability to concentrate. Of course, if the patient cannot perform simple calculations even in his native language, there is no point in asking him to do such tasks as serial sevens. Simple arithmetic calculations can be done with many patients. As with proverbs, this is another area in which planning ahead with the interpreter may be useful. Similarly, testing for memory function must involve objects and events that are familiar and recognizable to the patient. Before testing for memory function, the clinician should make sure that the selected items fit with the patient's background. Unlike the clinician in our vignette who mistook the patient's taking herbal medicine as suicidal intent, both suicidal and homicidal ideation need to be assessed directly and in a careful and sensitive manner. Despite the obvious challenges that refugees present, a wealth of diagnostically useful information can be obtained if the mental status examination is appropriately modified to fit the cultural background and current acculturation status of the refugee patient. There are a number of special issues that need to be considered when interviewing refugees. Awareness of these issues is very important for clinicians treating refugees. It is important to obtain a comprehensive trauma history, including torture and imprisonment, because many refugees have experienced serious, multiple traumas. Men, in particular, suffer from combat-related trauma. Among refugee women, there is a high incidence of rape. Refugee children often have experienced multiple traumas as well. However, information on torture and trauma may not be volunteered by the patient on the initial interview. Sensitivity to the patient's timing for disclosure is important. Dr. Sokum Chan, who survived the Cambodian Holocaust, offers some useful comments. The difficulty in the interview is they want to avoid memorizing the past hurtful experience that they have, I mean, uh, met, they have had a certain detail of horror that happened into their family or the, to themselves, like uh, some detail of torture. And also, I think that they, it seems that they feel guilty about their lost one, family, wife, husband, or children. And also that they have feel powerless during that time. They couldn't do anything to help them. So they don't want to talk about that story again. Also, on the other hand, I, I think that the patient, most of them, especially the more severe traumatized one, they are very forgetful. 
they couldn't even recollect their own past experience, hurtful experience that, I mean, happened during the communist time. And this uh, could lead sometime to some made-up detail that, like, uh, to compensate the memory gap. So we cannot say the story that we collect at the first time could be accurate. One remark. Please do not try to dig deep into some detail that they don't want to tell you at the first interview. If not, you're going to hurt their feeling and also make them losing confidence on you. Torture, unlike other psychological trauma, is designed to systematically break down the individual's personality. Consequently, these victims have specific treatment needs which are often not met within standard clinical settings. That is why there are specialized centers such as the Center for Victims of Torture in Minnesota and the Rehabilitation Center for Torture Victims in Denmark. Precisely because of the multiple trauma and losses involved in the refugee experience, it is often difficult not only for mainstream professionals but also for ethnic workers to interview refugee patients. Patients' stories may remind the ethnic workers of their own traumatic refugee experiences. Dr. Chan shares this comment with us. I feel every time that I ask them about their loss, I mean children, wife, or torture, those memory come back right away, like a fresh to me, too. Uh, for me, as I have experience working with a Cambodian patient since 1965 in health center, I mean rural area, and also in different hospital in Phnom Penh. So those feelings just come up like a quickly, brief second, and then, I mean, I could get rid of them because I understand why those memory come back. You cannot get rid of them, even though you try whatever, how strong you are, you cannot. So it's a normal that those things happen, I mean, become, I mean, present again in my mind. Western clinicians are generally not well trained to deal with severe trauma. This results in reluctance to inquire thoroughly about traumatic experiences or in feelings of helplessness. Clinicians should be aware of these reactions in themselves and in their staff members. Only after these reactions are addressed can the evaluation and treatment of the traumatized refugee patient proceed successfully. Rating scales are a helpful tool in psychiatric interviewing. We will be very brief on this topic since it will be covered in more detail in another program of this videotape series. Generally, rating scales are helpful in obtaining further diagnostic information and in confirming the evaluation results. Clinically significant scores can aid the practitioner in formulating diagnosis and in developing treatment plans accordingly. They can also be used in follow-up visits to monitor change in symptom pattern and to determine the level of functioning. Rating scales are particularly useful with refugee patients who do not readily volunteer information on interview. Another important content area is the evaluation of children and adolescents. Dr. Carlin suggests additional content areas that are important in evaluating children and adolescents. Of course, most of the points we have already made about the psychiatric interview apply to children and adolescents as well. It's important to inquire about their age at time of departure from the country of origin, family relationships such as the presence or absence of family members in the resettlement country, general health issues, pre-resettlement factors such as educational background and experiences of trauma, and post-migratory factors such as expectations of the child or the adolescent in the new educational and family setting. During the evaluation of the adult or child patient, the clinician can expect to have contact with family members, possibly conducting interviews with all of the members present. It is important to recognize that a family, as defined by refugees, may not be the nuclear family that is more typical of mainstream patients. The clinician must also recognize the hierarchical structure of the family and direct questions appropriately. For example, addressing the head of household first in the session. Since interviewing refugee patients so often requires the use of an interpreter, 
It's important to discuss, from the mental health professional's perspective, some of the major issues involved in working with interpreters. As part of this series, an entire videotape program has been prepared on the roles and responsibilities of interpreters and on dealing with particular interpreting challenges. In this videotape, we will focus on working with interpreters in a mental health setting and offer guidelines to clinicians who work with interpreters. Suggestions for working with untrained interpreters are also offered because trained interpreters are frequently not available. The use of untrained interpreters clearly presents not only a practical, but also an ethical dilemma for the clinician. As a general rule, you should avoid using family members or friends of the patient as interpreters because they lack objectivity and may interfere with the assessment process. Clinicians must also be aware of the additional interpersonal dynamics involved in the session when the interpreter is present. For example, the interpreter may know the patient socially. Older refugees often do not want to share personal information in sessions with young interpreters present. Traumatized refugee women often feel uncomfortable with a male interpreter. These added dynamics can affect the development of trust. It is, of course, essential that confidentiality requirements that guide the clinician also apply to the interpreter. This should be explained to the patient at the start of the session. Another important function for the interpreter may be that of cultural broker. At appropriate times, the interpreter may step out of role and explain or clarify cultural differences for the clinician. The following are major points to keep in mind when working with trained interpreters. Develop a working relationship with the interpreter. Meet with the interpreter before the evaluation to discuss the goals and purpose of the interview. It is helpful to decide initially on the mode of interpretation, simultaneous or consecutive. In addition, the clinician can obtain culturally relevant details from the interpreter before the evaluation. For example, appropriate proverbs to use in the mental status exam. Direct questions to the patient, not to the interpreter. Keep your questions simple. Avoid the use of idioms, slang, or double negatives. Encourage the interpreter to interpret everything the patient says. The interpreter should not screen what the patient says, no matter how irrelevant it appears. Ask for clarification or elaboration from the interpreter if the response is unclear or if you are unsure as to what the response means. If the interpreter does not appear to understand the question or specific phrase, explain it in understandable terms. Hold post-session discussions with the interpreter. These sessions can be used to give feedback about the overall interview process and the working relationship. The interpreter may also have impressions about the patient or the interview, which can be elaborated during this time. Ideally, the clinician should work with trained interpreters. However, at times a clinician may be forced to rely on untrained interpreters. In those cases, some additional factors become important. During the pre-session meeting, assess the communication skills of the untrained interpreter with the needs of your patient in mind. Take into consideration your patient's cultural, ethnic, and linguistic background, as well as the interpreter's knowledge of mental health terminology and concepts. If the interpreter seems incapable of the task, the evaluation may need to be rescheduled with a more appropriate interpreter unless the patient is in acute distress. Spend more time in pre-session meetings with untrained interpreters. Be sure to discuss confidentiality and emphasize the need for accurate interpretation. Discuss the possible uncomfortable situations that may arise during the interview. These may involve patients using foul or insulting language and displaying bizarre or socially inappropriate behavior or other symptoms of mental illness that may be disturbing or bewildering to the interpreter. The interpreter needs to be informed that the client's comments or behaviors are likely to reflect only on the patient's illness. They do not reflect poorly on the interpreter, on the ethnic community, or even on the patient. Use a post-session meeting to debrief the interpreter carefully, particularly if the interview was emotionally charged. Remember, the guidelines for trained interpreters also apply for those who are not trained. We have introduced several major issues related to psychiatric interviewing with refugee patients. Cross-cultural psychiatric interviewing requires extra time and effort. But with care and sensitivity, 
Many cultural differences can be bridged and the clinician can obtain accurate information. Then the treatment of serious problems can begin with a much greater chance of success. The resource manual accompanying this videotape provides further information. Thank you for watching.